Did you know that one of the most common front limb orthopedic issues in dogs starts developing before they're even a year of age? It's called elbow dysplasia. I'm Dr. M, a welcome to VMC. Elbow dysplasia impacts thousands of dogs every single year, and in today's video, we are going to cover what it is, what symptoms to watch for, how we treat it, and everything else that you need to know about elbow dysplasia. Join me, you'll learn something today. So in order to explain what elbow dysplasia is, it's important for you to first know that the elbow joint is actually composed of three separate bones. This is the humerus, which is in the upper part of the arm, and then the radius and the ulna in the lower part of the arm. When the elbow joint is normal or healthy, all three bones work together perfectly in order to smoothly go through a normal range of motion. If any part of the interaction between these three bones is not perfectly in alignment, this usually happens because of abnormalities during development, then we get what is called elbow dysplasia, and this happens because there will be abnormal forces put on specific parts of those three bones which causes inflammation, pain, and this compilation of issues that we call elbow dysplasia. Elbow dysplasia is an issue that can involve one or multiple different abnormalities within the elbow. We subcategorize these into two groups. The first is an ununited ancaneal process. The ancaneal process is connected to the ulna from fibrous tissue, and the current most accepted theory is that you can get an un united ancaneal process when there are abnormal biomechanical forces put onto that part of the bone because of a rapidly growing dog changing the forces within that elbow. When you have a UAP, the elbow joint becomes unstable. This results in inflammation and arthritis formation within the joint. The second major subcategory involved in elbow dysplasia is medial compartment disease. You can have a fragmented coronoid process. You can also see osteochondrosis. We aren't sure exactly what causes these to occur. We might also have a mismatch in how the bone length or bone growth is occurring, and that can result in the joint not functioning properly. And then lastly, we can have abnormalities within the cartilage of the elbow joint. 80% of patients that have elbow dysplasia will have it in both elbows. And no matter what specific issue is ongoing, elbow dysplasia will result in inflammation in the elbow, which is painful, damage to the cartilage in the joint, and then over time you will also get arthritis formation, which will cause further pain and loss of function. There are a number of theories about the specific causes and risk factors for elbow dysplasia. We do think that genetics is a major and significant contributing factor here. And we do see more elbow dysplasia in large and giant breed dogs, with some breeds being overrepresented compared to others. Of course, there are exceptions to every rule. So just because it may be a bit more common in large and giant breed dogs, every single dog and cat can develop elbow dysplasia dysplasia. Most people do think that elbow dysplasia is at least partially a multifactorial issue. We also think that trauma to the elbow can result in elbow dysplasia, and we also suspect that diet formulation is also a contributing factor. Let's dive into what the common symptoms that we associate with elbow dysplasia are. It is important to recognize that we will often start to see lameness or limping in dogs around four to five months of age, although in mild cases we may not see more obvious symptoms until they're a few years of age. And of course these dogs will have a front limb lameness. It generally will worsen over a period of weeks to months. It will tend to be worse after exercise but not be fully resolved after a period of rest. It can also be a challenge for some people to detect what's going on because so many of these animals have pain on both sides in both elbows and when you have a lameness on both sides of the body it's harder for a lot of 
clients to pick up that there's a problem. These animals are also likely to hold their paws rotated a bit inwards because they're trying to relieve pressure on the most painful part of their elbow. Sometimes we will see the elbows being held out away from the body. And if it is a more moderate to severe elbow dysplasia, then we will also tend to see that the animal is refusing to complete their walks or they might not want to play as much. They may hesitate with doing things like jumping or quick changes in direction. In order to diagnose elbow dysplasia, we start with a orthopedic exam, including analyzing your animal's gait. If you can bring video of when you note the issue is, that can be very helpful to your veterinarian. I always appreciate it when people bring receipts. Usually the dog will have more pain at the end of the elbow range of motion, whether that's fully bending it or fully extending it. We will then sedate your pet in order to get x-rays of where we've localized the pain to seem to be. Sometimes we will take x-rays of the shoulders and the elbows because it can be a bit challenging in some cases to differentiate where the exact issue is just from an orthopedic exam. Sometimes an x-ray is not sensitive enough to pick up on the changes in the elbow joint and or depending on what we see on those x-rays, the next step may be to send you to an orthopedic specialist. They may not need any additional imaging or they may be recommending things like a CT to get more information about that elbow joint or sometimes we will use arthroscopy, putting a little camera surgically into the joint in order to get a full clinical picture of what's going on inside that elbow. It is absolutely important to remember that the earlier we diagnose this, the better the long-term outcome is, especially if we can intervene before there's any significant arthritis formation in that joint. As with most orthopedic issues, treatment tends to be multifactorial. It will be important to keep your pet at a lean body condition score. For dogs, that means a four to five out of nine. We commonly use supplements like omega fatty acids to help joint health. We will also use anti-inflammatory medications like Onsior or Meloxicam. We may also use something like Adequan. Additionally, it will be important to modify your pet's enrichment and their environment. You need to ensure that they have grippy flooring. You need to use ramps to get up onto furniture or beds or into vehicles. And it will be advised to reduce any quick changes in direction that they might be doing. You will also need to avoid avoid exercise or activity levels that result in your dog being painful afterwards. It's also generally beneficial to work with a rehab and or conditioning expert who can help with the maintenance of musculature to support the elbow and to help reduce any compensation habits that your dog may have picked up because they were painful. In the vast majority of situations, surgery is helpful for these patients. There may be rare situations where we don't end up doing surgery, say if it's something incredibly mild, or if we have an elbow that is so severely impacted that it's not really a surgical candidate. Generally, we will do this surgery via arthroscopy using that little camera and some small tools to get into the joint and fix what the problem is. If there are, say, any bone fragments, removing those out of the joint is very helpful. We can also smooth out any cartilage defects and just make the joint function better than it was prior to surgery. Sometimes we can reattach an ununited ancaneal process. There aren't very many places that have the capability to offer for things like an elbow replacement and truly this is a very salvage procedure that's not appropriate for the vast majority of animals with elbow dysplasia. There are a lot of risks with trying it and it's not something that's been well documented or done frequently in veterinary medicine yet. It's important to remember that elbow dysplasia is a lifelong condition. We cannot completely cure it. The goal is to maintain the elbow's range of motion and mobility, to maintain your pet's function, to reduce inflammation and pain in the elbow, and to slow down the progression of arthritis in the joint. Depending on exactly what issue or issues your dog 
pad with their elbows. The exact surgical procedures will vary and after surgery you should expect to keep your animal quiet for at least a couple of weeks. As soon as their surgeon has cleared them then you will start to see a rehab specialist to help your pet on their recovery journey. As you know, whenever possible, I prefer that we prevent problems rather than try to fix them once they've already happened. So what we can do about prevention is absolutely key. First and foremost, only work with breeders who are properly health screening the dogs that they're using for breeding. So for example, with my dog, both of her parents were screened for elbow dysplasia and did not have any. If they did, they would not have been used for breeding. It's also important to avoid high impact activities in growing dogs. And lastly, it is key to feed a properly formulated research-based and size appropriate puppy formula to your dogs. You also want one that is meeting the WSAVA guidelines. Unfortunately, if your animal already has elbow dysplasia, it is not something that can be cured and it can sound a bit intimidating, but many animals do really well after a combination of surgical and medical management is implemented and they can have wonderful long lives with elbow dysplasia in a lot of cases. Now, of course, there will be some variety in specific outcomes from dog to dog because it does depend on what the actual issue within the elbow is and it will also depend on how early you catch that there is a problem. The earlier it's caught, the earlier it is addressed, the better your dog will do. On average with treatment, 85% of cases show a significant improvement in comfort levels, which is wonderful. And then we just focus on maintaining mobility and maintaining comfort for as long as is possible. Arthritis will progress in these joints and because arthritis is such a common problem in both cats and dogs, I already have a series on the crucial aspects of management of osteoarthritis in our animals. I'll make sure they're linked in the video description for you just in case you missed them earlier. Please make sure to comment down below if you've had an animal who's dealt with elbow dysplasia. I'd love to hear what your experience was and how it was managed. If you have a topic you would like me to cover in the future, please comment that down below as well. We do put up a new video most Fridays and YouTube thinks you'll like this video. Take care and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye! The earlier we diagnose this, the better the long-term outcome is.